Hello, everyone. Welcome for joining us tonight for the Spinehawk event. I want to remind everybody that tonight's event will be um, recorded. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm Sydney Blackwell from the Friends of Pinehawk. Um, before I turn over the program to our talented speakers, I want to tell you just a little bit about um, the Friends of Pinehawk. So some time ago, about 20 years ago, when they were putting in a sewer, there was a, an archaeological site found at the uh, South Acton near the Assabet River, which when explored actually turned out to be a site of 7,000 years ago that showed the really the extent of the human habitation in the area. Some of the local people thought, um, we, we really need to get this word out and people would be interested. And the Friends of Pinehawk was born. Um, since then, we've been dedicated to um, the historical and cultural um, region and trying to get information out about the indigenous past that we're so fortunate to have around us. Um, and we've produced, well, we haven't produced, but we've sponsored over 220 programs over the last 20 years. Um, there's a lot, there are some still, there are a lot of lithic structures around the area such that the uh, Acton area has become very familiar with these and actually last year passed a local archeological protection bylaw, um, which was the very first in the state of this kind that we know of. So a tribute to our community. Um, let's, see. let's see. We're sponsored by um, the Acton Library and the Friend Freedom's Way National Heritage Area for which we're very um, fortunate to have their help. So this webinar, but you didn't come for that, you came for the webinar. Um, the webinar is, will be such that you won't have voices, you won't be able to see your faces, but you will have a voice in the Q&A. So if you have a question, just click the Q&A button, which is down near the bottom, should be on the bottom next to the hand um, symbol. And then um, Greg Paris, one of our Pinehawk members, will take your questions and ask them of um, Tom and Eva as we go along. And so let me introduce our, our very talented, as I mentioned, um, speakers tonight. Thomas Elmore, as Tom, from the GeoNav Group, and Eva Gibovic of Ceremonial Landscapes Research. Um, Tom, what began for him as an interest in LIDAR technology soon became a passion. And in 2018, he founded the GeoNav Group. Um, and I don't know if he's had a chance to put his LIDAR camera down since, but we're very fortunate to, as he's continued to push, you'll see how much he's used and pushed this technology. Eva works closely with, um, with Tom. She's had a lifelong interest in lithic structures before there was such a term as um, the lithic landscape. And she is, uh, I believe, uh, the founder of Ceremonial Landscapes Research, which does um, mapping and analysis and documentation on ceremonial landscapes, um, ceremonial stone landscapes as recognized by the tribes. Um, so Eva and Tom not only use the cutting edge technology in their work, they have really honed and sharpened this technology to push it to its, um, to its max. So without ado, Tom, Eva, thank you. Thank you, Sydney. All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Ilmore, and tonight uh, we want to introduce ancient to the modern and uh, to document stone features and landscapes using modern tools and software. And what Eva and I are going to do is, is go through a series of the programs, hardware, and software that we use on um, various sites. We're not focusing on one site, but using several different sites with the ultimate presentation at the end where we're, we're using our, our software and screen share on a single site. Next, Eva. So um, I'm Eva Gibovic and I started, I was introduced to some of these sites when I was eight which was a long time ago, um, by a local man who was uh, a member of Early Sites Research Association, which predated NERA. And um, I've 
worked over the last 15 years, I've worked mapping. Um, it's been a lifelong interest of mine, but 15 years ago, I um, was introduced to and started working with varying um, um, federally recognized tribes in Southern New England on um, doing mapping um, and of ceremonial features. And, and um, it's, and then I met Tom. <laughs> and I am a historical landscape architect by training. I've been practicing landscape architecture since 1985. And when I, first got into investigating LIDAR and drones and, and photogrammetry, um, I landed on the scanner that uh, you see in the picture here. And it was about a year after I set up the company that I was introduced to lithic sites. You know, I grew up in the Hudson Valley. They're all over the place. Never once was I introduced to them until spring of 2019. Eva and I actually started working together on a project at Manitou Hashinosh Preserve in Rhode Island about two years ago now. And, you know, we developed a good rapport. Uh, we have a third person on the team who's the audience in the audience here. And when we get together, we ask questions and we push each other to push the technology and the software and the ideas and the creativity. And some of that you're gonna see tonight. So our, present, our presentation is about the technology and software for the accurate and digital documentation for studying ceremonial stone features and landscapes. And here are two photographs. Um, one looks like a face and one looks like a turtle effigy. And both of these are photographs that I, I took and, and uh, put in here to kind of set the stage for what's in front of us. So, when we were talking about what we were going to present, um, we really wanted to talk about the ultimate goal that we have is in terms of preservation. And so there, when you're thinking about preservation and documentation, um, you got to ask some questions. It's like, what it, why are you documenting this? Um, the, the, the bad news some of the time is that you're documenting it before destruction. Um, some of the, the gas line work that, that we did with the tribes, um, we knew that they were coming right after us to, to destroy it. Um, that wasn't as much fun as some of the things we're doing now. Um, and the, what are you going to do with your data? That's been, um, that's been a central issue ever since I started working with, with anybody. Um, is it going to be public? Is it going to be private? Um, the level of accuracy that you need. What is it you need for a certain situation? Do you need to simply just be able to get back to that site? Or do you want to look at alignments um, or, or their relationships to other things? That makes accuracy much more important. Um, again, how are you going to use your data? Who's going to have access to it? Uh, who you're going to share it with? Uh, it, and one of the things that we have been very careful about in this presentation is that anything you see here um, that is private is not going to have any identifying information um, because we don't generally share data with anybody other than the people we're working with. Um, is this a site that you're going to be able to preserve? Um, who owns it? Um, how, how are you going to move forward? Um, is it going to be a conservation restriction? Is it just going to try to be hidden in the woods, which is what we've done for a lot of things in the past. And sometimes that works. Sometimes um, having people know about it is a better way to preserve it. Sometimes um, just hiding it is. So those are all questions that one needs to answer. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about low tech stuff as well as our high tech stuff, um, because when you're documenting things, all of it has a role. Um, so this down below here is a cross section from the work that um, Jim Maver and Byron Dix 
did back in the 80s. And, and I'm not, I don't, I, they were, they were really technical guys, but this is a hand drawing. This on the, the right hand side is a representation which looks remarkably like this. This is the, both of these are the Upton chamber. This one on the right was done with an iPhone with a LiDAR app. So we're gonna go through some of the things that you probably already know, but we're going through them quickly anyway. Um, and then we'll get to the, the higher tech things um, a little further on. So one of the things that people, I assume that people know, but they don't necessarily, is that your GPS, your, your cell phone and any GPS enabled camera holds the, um, in the metadata, it holds the longitude, latitude and altitude of that site. So the good news is that if you want to share that with someone, if you want to, you can bounce all of those photographs into GIS very quickly and have, um, and have a sense of where you are. Um, so anybody that I sent this gorgeous picture to, this is, this is in Northern Vermont, um, anybody who I sent this picture to would have the coordinates right in there. Um, of where the camera was located, not of yes. the scene in the distance. Yes. Um, I have put together a, a YouTube um, that goes through how you know whether you have your, your cell phone is set up to take the GPS coordinates and how to turn them on and off. I, we didn't want to take the time to do that here, but this YouTube link will get you there for an iPhone. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the cell phone apps that I use on a regular basis. Um, the Sun Surveyor, that's this one, has a lot of important information um, and it knows where you are generally. Um, the, the most important piece here that I use on a regular basis is Solar Noon, which is also known as Astronomical Noon. And I'll talk a, a little bit about that later um, and why that is important. This is the Theodolite app. And this is, you take a photograph and it records not only the date and time, it gives you your GPS coordinates. Um, it gives you the bearing that you're looking at and the altitude, elevation, all of that kind of thing, which is nice as a documentation tool. Um, the Clinometer app um, measures the height so if you're standing here in this picture and you're looking up there and you wanna know how high it is, that clinometer um, app does that for you. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why you care about that in a few minutes. The GPS tracks uh, app um, keeps track. It does a lot of things, but I use it because um, I like to keep track of a track, a literal track of where I'm walking, and that can be um, um, sent into uh, GIS as well. I often want to, when I'm going to a new site, if there's a lot of trails, I like to to um, to make a, a map of where the trails are so that people can orient themselves more easily. So you got an app yeah. that you that you didn't mention is an app called Sun Seeker or Moon Seeker. Are you aware of either of those and how you would use them? Um, I'm not familiar with those in particular. Um, I'll write them down and check them out. Um, there are a lot of apps out there and, um, and I don't have any pretense that, that I know the best ones. Um, these are the ones I use. That's okay, thanks. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is an example, and I know that compasses, people think that compasses are, you know, uh, really low tech and not, you know, everybody knows how to use a compass, but my, my finding over the years is that that's not really true. So if you are holding a compass out in front of you, um, the way Molly is in, in these pictures, you don't know what you're aligning it to, because you're just holding it out in front of you. If you just need a rough idea, 
of what direction you're looking in, then that's okay. But if you want something accurate, then you need to do things a little more systematically than that. Um, magnetic compasses, um, sighting compasses where you look through them as Molly is here, there's a line that shows up in there and it shows how what you're actually aligning to. There are a number of them that are out there, different kinds. This one um, down here, you use the reflection. That's a more standard one. This one you look through. Um, when you are looking through and you're aligning two points, that's when you're going to get the best reading. Uh, cell phone co um, compass apps are so tempting, but you really have to do your research as to what it is. This is one that I like. Um, it, it, you have to go into the settings, however, to tell whether you're looking at true north or magnetic north. Um, and so you really need to know which you're working with. Um, this is an example where this compass is set up, same app, this compass is set up for true north, this is set up for magnetic north. Yes, Greg, I see you showed up. That's, that's right. Uh, what about the degree accuracy of this particular compass? Uh, plus or minus how many degrees azimuth? Well, so so here's the so, deal. So Tom has learned not to use his phone. That's how bad mine is. <laughs> so it's really interesting. So the phone on the, the left-hand side here, um, well, actually, this whole picture was really hard to make because they're using GPS signals. And as I hope you all know, um, you're standing there with your GPS and it's bouncing around because it's bouncing from satellite to satellite. So even being able to get these two to, to be somewhat accurate was hard. Um, this cell phone here is my old cell phone. And with this particular app, um, they're pretty similar. Um, other apps, um, the newer iPhone was much more accurate. Um, but if you want accuracy, a cell phone is not the way to get it. Um, so here's another picture of that same app. This was my Compass 54 Pro was my favorite app until I realized that you, you can, what I liked about it is that you could do true and magnetic and you know which you were looking at until I realized that for some reason, the people who made this have it reversed. When it's tr it says true, then you're looking magnetic. And when it says magnetic, you're looking true. So I don't recommend this one. The Compass Commander is one that I found recently. I am in search of another one that I really like. This one does show you the magnetic reading here, and it tells you the um, the true reading here. So, but it's not too easy to read. So, I'm in I'm in search of another one. So, put in put in your uh, in the chat some good recommendations. Yes, do Greg. You, in the case of Commander Compass, do you need to specify what the declination is, or does it know it from a lookup table in your location? It knows it from your um, GPS location that's in your phone. Great, thanks. Yeah, and that and that's good. That's good. It's, I would like it if it was easier to read. This this one, you know, it's kind of nice because it gives you you can have a choice of different backgrounds. Um, so it's not a bad app. I I kind of like it. I this app just gave me so much more information that I liked. Except it's not accurate. Okay. So the way you know what is accurate, um, one way um, is what I call, or what is called the great, the, the great pole of Mavor. Now, Jim Mavor and Byron Dix were the two people who did research in the 80s who wrote the book Manitou. Um, and the, the idea with the, pole, the, the great pole of Mavor, which now lives with a with a friend of mine and and who taught me this procedure you basically you put up a, a, a tall pole and if you go back to the the sun surveyor app that's going to tell you when astronomical noon is 
And where's the thing? Yep, here we go. So the shadow that the pole casts on astronomical noon is going to be true north. Here's the, I, I've put my north arrow down here, um, but this is at astronomical moon. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet. It's going to be, well, I guess if you're in the southern hemisphere, it matters. But, but in the northern hemisphere, at astronomical noon, that line is always going to be true north. And I'm losing the arrows. So then using a sighting compass, um, you're going you're gonna to know there how many degrees off magnetic your compass is. Um, or if you're using, you want to check your cell phone, you can line up those as well. So the general idea when you're, when you're um, taking readings is that having uh, two points lined up is going to give you your most accurate reading. Okay, so if you're looking at alignments, you need to pay attention to the fact that the height of a hill that you might be looking at changes your perception of where the sun is going to set. So if I'm standing out in my yard looking at, at Joshua Mountain here, um, if, if I put my compass out and said 270, that's when equinox is, um, and I and I marked where 270 was uh, with my poles, I would not be seeing the sunset on equinox because of the height of the hill changes that. Now this is the Stellarium program that I've used with a, an ocean with a flat horizon. And on equinox, on a flat horizon, the sun is going to set due west. Simple. But then here's my mountain. This is, I, I went in and adjusted for the height of the mountain here, which was about seven degrees, I think. Um, and this is the actual time and date that the sun is going to set on the equinox. So, so if alignments are important, then you need to pay attention to whether you have a level horizon. And if you're looking west, um, if you have an elevated horizon, the, the sun will set higher in the sky and it will uh, set sooner than if you had a flat horizon. So if you're looking at a stone row or, well, go ahead, Greg. It's okay. Um, yeah. how, how accurate are the clinometers that you're using to actually measure the angle of the height of the hill? If, if the clinometer app that I use is really just like, because it's a GPS enabled thing, um, it is, um, it, it's not incredibly accurate. If you wanted accuracy, you would, there's, there's other tools. There is an inclinometer that looks um, pretty much like um, a magnetic compass that you look through. That's going to be more accurate. Um, if you just need a ballpark, um, then the app gives you a sense. For instance, I was, I was looking for the heliacal rise of Sirius. And I was trying to figure out whether I would be able to see it over my mountain. And so I went out and I was able to get a ballpark figure of uh, the height of the hill. And then I could tell that, yeah, I'm not going to see the heliacal rise because it's going to be behind the mountain. Right. But could I find the exact point from that? No. Okay, so, thank you. So many times people will look at, um, at stone rows and, and put their compass out. And even if they, they have two points and measure between them, um, you're looking uphill and that's going to change um, where the sun is going to appear to set. Um, so you need to know, know if you're looking uphill or downhill, um, those, those factors go into alignments. Unless you happen to be there on the day. And Byron Dix always told me that you can go do your, your technology, 
but go and ground truth it um, because that's how you're really going to know. Um, so we were talking accuracy um, and the so this is this is Chris and he is a surveyor that was working with Tom and I on a project and the surveyors use a total station, which um, it gets, I, I can't remember the number that, that Chris said, but it was below one center of accuracy, one centimeter of accuracy. And that's really darn good. Um, this picture here is the, the, the equipment that I have. It's an Arrow 100. Um, um, EOS Aero 100 antenna. And depending on the conditions, I can get down to 20 centimeters, which is about seven inches. Um, and using my iPad app, um, the field, um, field maps app, I can, uh, I'll talk more about that later. But, but those two things go together to, and most, most always, even in the woods, I can get uh, 50 centimeters of accuracy. A Garmin handheld GPS, they, they tell you it's going to be three meters. And cell phones, um, what they tell you is that it's two to four meters of accuracy. The cell phone apps tell you something different often, but I'm not sure what the reality is. Yes, Greg. You mentioned that your arrow antenna system will work even in the woods, but what about plus or minus leaves? You're going to have problems with the signal. The the um, even in the summer, I can get sub meter accuracy. I might I will not be able to get down to the 20 centimeters in the woods with leaves. Um, and so this gets back to what level of accuracy do you need? Even when I'm. Eva, you also need to talk about sunny day versus cloudy day. Yes, yes, cloudy days, cloudy days um, do interfere with the signal. Um, and so that's a factor. When I'm working with Tom, because of the accuracy that he has with his LIDAR, I'm picking sunny days. We're trying to find places that without tree cover so I can get as close to 20 um, centimeters as I can. Um, was there another question, Greg? That's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So this is this is the the EOS Aero antenna software, and what this shows is this is this was taken in at twelve thirty um, in the afternoon, and these dots are the satellites. If they're dark colored, that means they're in use. If they're light colored like number 13, we're not getting any information from that. So when, when I went out um, a few days ago um, to take this picture, it took about five minutes to get to 28.7 centimeters of accuracy. And, and that's kind of a general rule when, when you're taking, when you want accurate GPS readings, you need to stay in one place for about five minutes, even with good equipment. Um, so 16 out of the 38 that were in the sky were being used. Um, at 5.15 that same day, there were 21 satellites, but I wasn't getting nearly as good accuracy because there weren't as many um, of the ones that that were giving me information. Um, so time of day matters um, and cloud cover matters. Yes, Greg. The number you cite here for accuracy, uh, what provides that? Okay, so um, when I'm taking points with, with the ArcGIS app um, on the iPad, this is what the arrow app tells me. What I'm doing is I'm taking data in the field maps app, which is an ArcGIS app, and that's telling me what the accuracy is. 
And so when I'm when I go out, um, if I'm if I'm simply taking a GPS reading um, to document a feature, um, 28, 28 centimeters of accuracy is not bad because that's about how big the features are to begin with. If I'm going to be working, um, trying to help ground Tom's LIDAR, then I want to get as accurate as I can. Great. Thank you. And by the way, let me remind people who are listening, uh, please send any questions you wish to ask, and I'll see them and ask them on your behalf. Cheers. All right, All right Tom. All right. So my part of the uh, presentation discussion is talking about LIDAR photogrammetry 3D printing. And what this, this first series of, uh, of a video um, is to just run through this site that you see here, and we're gonna end up with a 3D printed model. So Eva, just stop it here for a second. So this is one of the sites that um, we've worked on. And the scene that you see on the screen is made up of 10 or 12 different scans that I've registered together, geo-referenced to Eva's GPS points, and then we've used it in, in a, a variety of scenarios. And we're gonna be focusing in on the wooded area down in the lower left-hand corner. So my software allows me to zoom in and do all sorts of great things. And the reason why you see the different colors on the screen is the light colors are the trees and the vegetation where the tan and browns are is the ground. Um, but what I wanted to show you here is hidden in the forest here is a beautiful stone structure. And with the software, we can zoom into it. And in a second, you'll see that we've got the capability to classify the trees and turn the trees off. So we'll just let this run for a second. And so click of a button and we, we turn the classified trees off. And what this allows us to do is to see the landscape without the vegetation. And several of my clients are just blown away by all of a sudden they can see the relationship of features even 25 feet away or a thousand feet away. And we've got another scenario coming up for you here in a bit. Um, but this structure here has some solar alignments. And in this scene here, it looks like a bird. Um, it's also purported to look like a, a, a turtle. And, um, and it's just interesting in real life as you walk around it, how it just changes form. And it's, it's an amazing feature. And so we're gonna go from the LIDAR, which is what you're seeing here, to photogrammetry. So Eva, stop this for a second. So the, the picture on the left is a photograph of the structure. Um, the picture on the right is a screen capture of the digital 3D model of photogrammetry. And this picture on the right is made up of about 75 to 100 photographs. And the, the software that we have access to is Agisoft Metashape. There are some other ones out there that are more expensive. There's some free versions out there as well. And what they do is they stitch the photographs together to give you the digital model. So go ahead, Eva. And here is the rotating digital model um, in Agisoft. So you can see the clarity and the resolution that the, the software creates. And then from that, we run it through a couple other programs. Eva, stop it for a second. I run it through a couple other programs and we can actually do accurately scaled 3D printed models. And so the scene on the left is the model in front of the photograph. The scene on the right is the model in front of the digital model. And then the picture in the middle is the little model sitting on my desk. So we go from a digital to a photographic, to a physical twin. And next, what we're gonna talk about is the LIDAR that I've gotten 
uh, very accustomed and attuned to, but I had to go back and do a little research as to what were the origins of LIDAR. And LIDAR is known as light detection and ranging. And it started in the 60s with the lunar and satellite uses. Um, and what it does, the scanner sends out infrared laser beams that hits a target, reflects back off, and is detected on a receiver back at the scanner. And uh, depending on the technology you're using and the elevation that you're at and the speed at which you're moving, it changes the, the accuracy or the, or the spacing between the points. And so LIDAR is also referred to as a point cloud, but it's generically called laser scanning. And it gives us a 3D digital model of whatever we're scanning. Um, and so why do I bring LIDAR into these ancient stone lithic landscapes? It's fast and it's accurate. You know, I've got accuracy of one to three centimeters. So anything the size of your pinky, I can pick up a twig that size. Um, I cannot pick up cracks in mortar. You know, that's the more high tech, more expensive uh, scanner. But I'm able to capture in real time. With my software, I can create uh, models, plan views, section views, elevations. I can do fly throughs, um, and we'll get into that in a little bit here. I've had, I, back up just a second, Eva. I've had the luxury of meeting Eva and Dave and other professionals who bring to the table their technology and their creativity. And together, you know, we're really pushing the limits of what the intended use is of these in a very creative way. We happen to be focusing on these structures, but it really could be almost anything. Okay, Eva. And so here's my scanner. I have a Paracosm PX80. It has, as I mentioned, one to three centimeter accuracy, and it scans 80 meters in 360 degrees. It has a color camera on the top of 250 degree angle. I pick up 300,000 points per second as I'm walking, and I've done some tests, and I get an average of 150,000 points per square meter on the ground. That does not include the canopy of the trees or the tree branches if I'm walking through the, the woods. But the reason why I chose this scanner is because of the colored point cloud. And I'm a landscape architect by training. I'm very visually oriented and I, I wanted the color. Again, it's fast and accurate. I can scan indoors or outdoors. And as I tell people, it's really, I'm only limited by my lack of creativity. Tom, a question about how this interfaces with the the, the georeferencing. Yes. Uh, if you have one to three centimeter accuracy of the equipment, but you have to tie the point clouds together with a GPS, uh, how can you maintain that one to three centimeter accuracy when the GPS is at best only 20? Yep. And so it was a very big dilemma when I first met Eva. Um, but backing up, when I register my uh, scans together, I do it manually and I can get them within half an inch of accuracy to the point that as you're moving through the scene, if the color doesn't change from one scan to the other, you will not see where I've sliced them or spliced them together. Um, with regard to the GPS accuracy, you're going to see in a bit how we do that. And at that point, we'll talk about why I space where I want my uh, GPS points taken and, and how I've learned to uh, work through that level of accuracy. Thank you. Yep. All right, Eva, I'm ready. And so I, here's a picture of a cemetery, ancient burying ground in Hartford. And I have it because it's a great representation Photograph on the left is a photograph taken by a friend, Ty Tryon. The image on the right is from the 3D LiDAR scanner. And, you know, I worked really hard to set up the LiDAR to get this screen capture at the same angle, the building in the background, the same height, get the trees. But because of the focal length in the camera and the way the LiDAR measures, I was not able to match it up. But this is a great side-by-side uh, representation of the exact same scene. 
And so this is a little video put together on, on a, a site that we've worked on. And it's a presentation of three different types of point clouds. You're gonna see an aerial LIDAR point cloud, my handheld LIDAR, and then a photogrammetric model that's been converted to a point cloud that I've referenced into this whole scene. So go ahead, Eva. So we're starting here. This is an aerial LIDAR taken from an airplane. And those dots are the points. And Eva, can you just back it up, just to stop it and then back it up a little? So I started at this angle so you can see the undulations. Those undulations are the terrain. And um, so now, now you can run it forward. And I, I have purposely set those points up to be really big in scale. And in the center of the scene there, you see some olive green and some white and some brown. And that's the site that uh, we focused on. But I wanted to show you the relationship between the aerial LIDAR, the detail of the aerial LIDAR versus the detail of my scanner and then the photogrammetric uh, point cloud. So this, stop it here for a second, Eva. So this is a combination of three different scans. The lower right hand, the darker is a single scan. And then the, the two to the other uh, side are on the same sunny day in March. And it just happens how the sun picks up and is registered with the, the, the technology in the scanner. And that's about 1,200 feet from one end to the other, just to give you an idea of scale. OK. And we're going to be focusing in on the left hand portion here. So as the points are becoming more visible, we call that populating. And that's just the way the software is set up so it doesn't crash my very high powered uh, computer. Um, but with the software, I can actually do a cross section to show you what the difference is, not only in the resolution of the detail, but to give you an idea of the train. And that's about a 15 foot elevation difference between the high spot and the low spot in this scene. And then coming in, we're going to be focusing on uh, the the three, four large boulders in the center here. And so stop it for a second, Eva. So it makes it look like I'm flying in an airplane or a drone, but I'm actually I did I actually captured this entire site by walking with my scanner on that small stick, like you saw in the previous photograph. It's the software that I've chosen, the Vision LiDAR software, that gives me this flexibility to have a ground plane view or an aerial view or create cross sections. And that was one reason why I chose the software. OK, Eva. So one of the things I do is I can make the background black so that the LiDAR scan shows up uh, better. And so these boulders, the one in the foreground might be 10 or 12 feet in diameter. Um, so they're fairly large and they do have uh, some significant alignments. And we as a team have presented that in the past and are continuing to do more research on this site. But this is what I talked about earlier, which we can see the relationship of these boulders to the white boulders that were off in the distance there. And Eva, let this run, but I'm going to have you back it up. So the gray that you're seeing here is the photogrammetric point cloud that I referenced to my handheld LIDAR point cloud. So this, again, is made up of a series of photographs converted to a point cloud. And so we've figured out a way to, to get this high resolution, very detailed point cloud, almost photographic, into our software. And it, again, it just adds a total new layer of resolution, detail, and study opportunities. Because once it's in my software, 
I've got all these capabilities to manipulate it. And that's about a 15 degree angle of the topography on this site in this location. So it's fairly steep. So turn the trees back on just to give you an idea how wooded and covered the site is. And until I did my scanning and classified the trees and turned them off, my client had no idea the relationship. I mean, he knew the relationship between the boulders, but he wasn't able to see from this cluster to the other cluster that was 1,200 or 1,000 feet away. And by doing this, he really was able to see his landscape in a very unique manner, and he was just blown away by it. So stop it here for a second, Yuma. So one of the things that we did on this site is I classified all of the boulders that were of any scale, turned them red as you can see so that we can see any patterns here. And so everything is off except for the boulder. So even now you can let it run. And so I'm changing the background of the site or of the, uh, the ground, I mean. And again, by highlighting the boulders, they really, it just makes them jump right off the screen so that we can see the relationships and uh, the spacing between them. And there are, again, here, there are an awful lot of alignments. And so stop it here for a second, Eva. So this rock, what, the path was up to the to the upper and to the right of this screen of this rock here, and it appears to be a leaned over Manitou stone. And I said to my client, "Well, let me just grab it. You know, you never know." And lo and behold, it turns out to be something significant. So go ahead, Eva. And it really was only about five or six feet off the path. Um, and so what it is, it's the center point of five rocks, five large structures that are in a straight line. And we've also found out that it is in alignment to other stone boulders that we've uh, captured here. And turning the trees back on. All right. So that's this site was the first one that we've actually combined those three levels of point clouds into one project. So in the Upton Chamber, which is the, the site that we're going to be focusing on, I'm going to use my software live and Eva's going to do a demonstration with hers. The Mavor and Dick's hand drawing is in the upper left hand corner. Eva's uh, Metascan, which is the LiDAR app on our iPhone, is the image in the lower left-hand corner. And my handheld LiDAR is in the upper right-hand corner. And so we wanted to share these three technologies together, but also there's about a 40-year difference between the Mavor and Dix and what Eva and I captured. And Eva pointed out how accurately Mavor and Dix did their drawings. And so down below, I've uh, got some data information on point clouds and spacing. So the airborne, the uh, airplane and helicopter uh, point clouds, LIDAR is 
uh, spacing of five to 300 points per square meter. And that depends on the height of the aircraft, the speed at which it's going, obviously the technology. The higher points here are the privately flown LIDAR um, plane and, and helicopter that's used a lot uh, for the Mayan uh, studies in Central America that I'm sure you've seen on TV. The drone, the next one down, point clouds are 50 to 400. And again, that range is because they're either higher or they're going faster. I'm picking mine up, it's five and a half or six feet off the ground. And I'm walking back and forth and that helps me keep my accuracy of 150 points per square meter. The iPhone using my, my software, I calculated the spacing to be 10 to 15 millimeters apart. And the photogrammetric point cloud, the spacing is 0.4 to 0.7 millimeter spacing. And that's why that LIDAR, the point cloud in the previous video looked almost photographic. Yes, Greg. You talk about um, 150,000 points per square meter. What's the capture time? How long does it take you to actually do the walkthroughs to get this sort of data set? I walk at a very comfortable speed. I don't walk slow. I do walk slow compared to others, but um, I walk slow, but I walk back and forth. And the scanner weighs about eight pounds. And believe it or not, it gets heavy after about 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> um, I do have scanning capabilities of 30 to 35 minutes. But again, I can register as many scans together. And that's why um, I have such a high powered computer sitting here at my, at my desk. I've opted not to use cloud software um, because the cloud could get turned off and then I lose everything. And so I back up stuff to the cloud. I back up stuff to my desk. I back up stuff to portable, um, portable hard, drives. hard drives, thank you, that I keep outside in the shed in case something happens to the house. Great, thanks. Next, Eva. So this is um, the Metascan iPhone app, um, which I became aware of not all that long ago. I'm not sure how long it's been out, but um, basically um, it's doing a, a level, they call it LiDAR um, um, on an iPhone. So first I wanted to start with video documentation. Everybody knows how to take a, a video. Um, so, and, and that has its place. Uh, certainly if you're a better filmmaker than I, um, that helps. Um, but, so that's that. And then the iPhone, what I try to do in this little video is to show you what I see when I turn it on, which meant that I had to hold the iPhone with one hand and a camera with the other and so it's not as perfect as I would like it to be, but it gives you, so you start here, you press the button, and then you start doing this. You can see I struggled to, to get all of the iPhone in there. And you basically just go around the thing and you fill in all of the spaces. And you start with something like this blurry thing. And what I wanted you to do, this is, this is an actual time um, that it takes to process a feature this small. It's really fast. So it does this building mesh 15% or up to 60%, 90, 95, done. And then you can pick it up, you can twirl it. Um, you have your 3D representation. And if I had taken the time to um, clear out all of the, the debris around it, it would have obviously come out better. There's a site that I've been working on recently where I think we have somewhere around 72 features. It's an area where they're going to put in a housing development and we've been documenting what's there and 
trying to preserve as much as possible. Um, and this was the first time I've basically used this app to, to do 3D documentation of all of the features. With some of the larger features, um, I did the more traditional um, um, photogrammetry, taking many, many, many pictures on a tall pole uh, to get them. Um, but most of the features I was able to do relatively quickly um, and accurately so that we not only have um, photographic and, and point information for these, these features, but we also have the 3D. Okay, Tom. So now we're gonna play with my software focusing on the Upton Chamber and Heritage Park. And for those of you who don't know, this is the access point um, into the underground stone chamber. And so, so what you're looking at here is the colored point cloud. Again, one to three centimeters accuracy, picking up uh, about 500 or 150,000 points per square meter in the open area. Um, and obviously with the tree canopy and leaves, it could probably double that. So you can see here, here's a little kiosk. We've got a small parking area. Here's a little shed here in this location. And now the roof and the shed didn't come out very well because I didn't go on the backside and hold my scanner in the area. Um, but in this location in the lawn, you can see the bright orange and the bright yellow. So these are my cones that are numbered and my boxes that are numbered. And I've learned to space these out as far as I can from one another in areas that Eva or other people can shoot accurate GPS points. And so I'm actually using those to uh, geo-reference my scan to real world points. There's one here, 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 one here, one down here, and one over here. Now, I did put one over here across the bridge in the opening, but there were enough trees around that Eva moved it up here to the lawn. She wasn't able to get a good reading. Um, but just to give you an idea of, of what this software can do and what it can pick up. But again, as I've mentioned, we classify the trees and we can turn the trees off. So the chamber is over in this location. Oops, wrong spot. Come in here. Now this hole here, that's from the tree trunk by classifying that and turning that off, but we can look inside the chamber. So that's what you would see from the outside looking in. And by changing the scene here, I'm gonna go from RGB to a class, a, a class classification um, system and I have them color coded. The ground is gray. The stone walls are in the red. And the building is in the brown. And these are my cones in the blue. And so the chamber is color coded, but because the ground is in the way, you can't see it. But if we do this, there it is. So now what we'll do is using the software, we're gonna come in here, cut it out, and now we can see the relationship of the ground to the chamber. And then going back to RGB, um, you can see the stones. Now, presumably you, you'd think that we're looking at the outside of the chamber, but I captured the inside of the chamber. So you're actually seeing the inside of the stone uh, faces. But one of the things I wanted to show you here is this, the extensions here from the sides of the stones are the spaces between the stone that because we lit up the chamber and the access tunnel, the scanner went as far as it could see. So it's actually picking up the space between the stones. 
Tom, can I jump in for a second? Absolutely. Um, I just wanted people to know that that part of the reason that we can show you this uh, and that 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 um, we can tell you where it is is because it is um, open to the public. Um, it is a heritage park um, in Upton, and um, two individuals, Kathy Taylor and Becky Wetzel, have spent a good deal of their lives um, documenting things in, in um, Upton, but also doing the work to get this place preserved. Um, and I wanted to do a shout out to them because without this, you wouldn't be able to go see this. Right. And because it's a public park, even I felt that we could present it here as a project uh, where we have a lot of other projects that, as we mentioned earlier, we just don't show, we don't share. Um, so you saw the RGB, you've seen the classification. Now, if I change to intensity, everything goes black because it's in grayscale. But if I change the background to white, turn the trees off, and play with the intensity here. You can see the relationship of the chamber to the ground. And if from this view, if we take a cut through here, we can see the plan view that you saw earlier um, and how accurate it is relationship to Mavor and Dix. So this is, I'm gonna set it up for a second here, just a second. So if we do this kind of capture, turn off outside that, and I'm gonna pretend I'm inside the, the chamber, we can actually look outside and let me turn the trees back on and we can see the tree in the opening. And Mavor and Dix were looking for an alignment in this location and an alignment in this location. Actually, there were a lot more than that, Tom. I've just talked about two of them. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So I think that's where I want to end, Eva. I have to start sharing. While you're getting ready to share, let me ask a question, Tom. Uh, the view that you closed the Upton Chamber with, looking mm -hmm. out the entrance, um, is the accuracy of your point cloud and the accuracy of your geo-referencing sufficient to allow you to use any of that data to look to the horizon to do a virtual alignment as opposed to what Maver and Dix did with lights? Yes, as long as you understand um, those six cones that I showed you in the boxes. I'm able to pick the spot on the top of the box where Eva's points were anywhere from 20 to 30 centimeters off in any direction. And the reason why I want to space them out as far as possible, it evens out the error because some ironically are below grade and some are above grade to the left of the box, to the right of the box. And I haven't been able to figure out rhyme or reason why that is some below and above and left and right, but it is what it is. And so if I use six cones, it averages out the area error. If I use four cones, the error is greater. And wow. so if I had eight cones or 12 cones, but I've learned that six is sufficient for what we're doing. Again, going back to that very early slide, what is the accuracy you need? Why are you collecting it? And what are you gonna do with it? Mm -hmm. Now my software, I can't do what Eva is about to show you, which is why I export my data out in a format that she can use. And so she's gonna take it to the next level here. Thank you. One thing, one other answer to that though, Greg, is that if we needed more accuracy, than a surveyor who uses, who, who gets one to three centimeters or sub, sub centimeter accuracy, um, that would be the way to go. Yes. Um, okay. You so- We bring in a, a total station to measure those six points. 
Yes. And but there's a cost to that. Right. You know, for that project that we showed earlier, I don't know if it was fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars for the day. But we kept the guy busy. I mean, probably we shot, I don't know, hundred, two hundred shots for us. Yeah, we kept him really good. Accuracy. Yeah. Okay, Eva. All right. So before I get into showing you stuff um, um, in the LIDAR, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about the software that I use. So um, Esri is the name of the company that, that makes ArcGIS Pro. Um, so that's desktop software. Um, and the bottom line here is that it's a map attached to a database. Um, those are the, the key um, pieces. You can do a ton of things, um, a lot more than I have yet to learn. Um, the other, the, going along with that is the Field Maps app, which is on an iPad. You can only use it if you have an ArcGIS account. Uh, you can get a personal account for $100, and that um, that keeps you pretty pretty well. You, it's a, a subscription thing. It's, you get so many credits, all of that. Um, but um, so that's the ArcGIS Pro, the Field Maps app on the iPad, and that works in conjunction with the Arrow antenna, um, and and so those three. Uh, work together. Um, so this is this is a screenshot from Manitou Hasanash, um, and each one of these dots here is a feature that we mapped. Um, this is the database where we filled in information, and you can set up these um, fields to take whatever kind of information you want. Um, so we worked with um, with the um, the folks in Hopkinton and with the um, the Shippo's office um, in Rhode Island to come up with um, what kind of data we wanted to collect. So this is and how this is a this is a publicly known site, and again, that's why yes, this is why interested. we can talk about it. It's nice that there are a few publicly known spots that we can that we can talk about. Um, and this is, this is what I will be showing you in ArcGIS. This is the list of what shows up. I can add all kinds of layers to each map. Um, some of that um, information um, I get um, through mass, Ar um, um, mass, it's called Mass Mapper now. Um, and you can get layers for all kinds of things, including the aerial LIDAR, which is what you're seeing here. Actually, you're seeing the, sh um, the hillshade um, that is made from the aerial LIDAR. This orange line here is what the town assessor's map um, says the property actually is, which the assessor's maps um, were never made for the kind of um, accuracy and detail that, that we all use now. Um, so they're very rarely accurate. And in this case, when I'll show you a little later, this line actually goes right through somebody's house. So it gives you an idea of where they are, but um, if you're mapping a property, you wanna have something a little more accurate than this. Um, but again, it's a layer I can turn on and off. This is the database part. And so these are the cones. Um, this is this is from um, from the Upton Chamber. And these are the cones that points that I took for Tom. And this is where I'm where it records automatically. I don't have to all I have to do is take the point um, and it records. Um, the um, horizontal accuracy, the vertical accuracy, and a whole bunch of other, here's his longitude and latitude. Um, this is something called PDOP, which has to do with the spread of um, satellites that it's using. And low numbers here are what you're looking for, anything below three. Um, with this antenna, 
um, anything above two ends up, uh, it, it doesn't really happen anymore. Um, so that, and this is, these are all kinds of, you know, stuff you can do um, within the program. So I wanted to give you a look at that first. So what the heck is this? This is, this is what the plane takes. These are the images that the plane takes. But before I do that, so this is my table of contents. Um, and so this is where I can turn layers on and off. So this is what it starts out as. Um, and from this, um, Hillshade is made. And so I'm gonna, So I'm just turning off those layers. And this is the aerial LIDAR. Um, and so this is um, Pratt Pond, and this is also part of it. Um, if I zoom in too far, the LIDAR goes away. So I'm not gonna zoom in that far. Um, so this is the site. Um, if I go up to here, I've got all, all kinds of different possible layers to, to turn on here. Um, now, if um, these are, I'm gonna turn off the LIDAR, aerial LIDAR, if I can find it again, there we go. And I'm gonna turn that back on and turn that back on. So this is the latest um, um, orthography um, that I downloaded from the state. Um, and fortunately, they did these, these aerial photographs when the leaves were down. So we can see all kinds of cool things. We can see stone walls. Here's the pond. That's the site of the chamber. These are the, the cones uh, points that I took for Tom's um, <clears throat> LIDAR. So when I click on these dots, now each one of these dots could be a feature. We're showing you cones because, um, well, there aren't exactly features in this field, but again, we wanna preserve confidentiality around places. <clears throat> so these are the data fields, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, these are the data fields, and I can set up whatever fields I want. Here's the horizontal accuracy. Um, like at Manitou Hasanash, we measured all kinds of things, um, and you set up the database. Um, so, um, the photograph? The photograph. Um, okay, wait a minute. Um, so what I'm going to turn on. OK, so one of the things that you can do with the GPS enabled photographs is I can just bounce them right in to, um, to ArcGIS, and they show up as these little cameras. I can change the icon, but so I click on that and it shows you the feature um, and I can zoom in on this and it'll show me a big picture. So um, Greg, this is a representation of the accuracy of the GPS on my phone. If you saw the relationship of the dot for the photograph to the dot of the cone, you know, it's 25, 30 feet of distance. Cone yeah. six, cone five is right. even further apart. Um, so, and again, that's so, just knowing your technology. So we have found, we have discovered that Tom's phone is is probably less accurate than than my cell phone. Um, <laughs> um, so, and and what is clear to me is that my old cell phone, which was like an iPhone four, um, I have an iPhone twelve now, and it does matter. The accuracy is much better now than it used to be. Um, but again, if, you're, if your goal is to just get a whole bunch of pictures um, and get them on a map so you have a general idea of where things are, 
it's not a bad way to go. But if you wanted to take those positions and actually try to do some alignments based on yeah. them, then, then know, no. even being off 20 centimeters is going to be a problem. Yeah. Well, it depends on where, how far a distance you're doing. Um, it, the accuracy has, you know, it, it, it is an issue that has to be looked at and evaluated per site. So for instance, if I was measuring the distance between here and here, there would be other information that I would take in the field um, that would add to that level of accuracy. Okay. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's something that has to be addressed and the technology is not as good as we'd like it to be. Or rather, I should say that the technology that is affordable, um, um, and that matters. Yes. I could, I could, there's a, there's this level of technology called RTK um, that gets down to the level of what a surveyor does. I can, could get a unit that would attach to my iPhone and it's outrageously expensive. And you have to have a subscription um, that is like $10,000 a year to be able to process any of that. So, you know, People have budget limitations and and you do the best you can with what you got. And right. five years from now, probably iPhones will be even better. Um, Just okay. a heads up, there's 10 more minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna cruise. Okay, so, um, so we did that. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to zoom to, so one of the things about uh, Upton Chamber is that, um, that it is, um, is connected with Pratt Hill. And up on Pratt Hill, um, yep, wrong photograph, mm -hmm. how'd that happen? Oh, well, um, okay, let me try that one, turn that off. So this is what used to be on Pratt Hill before it was bulldozed by the then owner of the property. And this is one of the reasons why we do documentation because who knew when this photograph was taken that it might not be there. Um, but so one of the things about this is that from the Upton Chamber, um, Byron Dix and Jim Maver found that there were a number of alignments um, there's another, there was another feature here. This would be the, the Pleiades um, sunset um, or yeah, um, over the mountain, this would be summer solstice sunset. Um, if I just did a um, drawing a line three, 303 degrees for summer sunset, I would end up in the wrong place because of the hill. Um, and I'm gonna, there's a measuring tool here. So this line is not 303, it's really 299 because that accounts for the elevation of the hill. Um, and Byron and Jim have all of that data laid out in their book, which um, is really helpful. Um, okay, so I'm gonna jump to the 3D. So here's, here's Tom's LIDAR in, um, in ArcGIS. And I can, it takes a while to load and move around. Um, I'm going to, it does take a while to populate. Now I've got a really fast computer. Um, it, with the, the level of detail that Tom has, um, it doesn't quite keep up. Um, so I'm gonna turn off the park and leave on the Upton chamber. And so one of the things I wanna point out is by changing from my software to Eva's software, you can see some of the resolution downgrade 
but it's okay because of how we're using the technology. So what I'm able to do here, so this is looking into the chamber, but what's more interesting is when I look out. So this is, I have gone in um, and I'm looking out at Pratt Hill. And because she's got the park LIDAR turned off, that tree is not in the way. Right. So this is Pratt Hill in the distance. If I put in the summer solstice line, not um, it's not like as good as I'd like it to be. Um, it's another thing that I hope they work on um, is getting more uh, flexibility with that. But so those are alignments. Um, so if anybody has any questions, now's your opportunity. I don't know if, uh, I have to say what I would say is that I'm just completely like overwhelmed and can't wait to go back and see this again and again. Um, thank goodness we're recording it and it will be available to everybody. Mm -hmm. So before we close out, let's see if anybody has a question. No. So one of the last things I'd like to say is, you know, we're constantly developing our workflow. We don't have a written workflow and it depends on the site and what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, but I think the takeaways of tonight is you saw some of the technology that we're using. You've seen some of the software we're using. And, you know, unfortunately we had to limit our presentation to uh, two sites just because they, we felt that they had to be publicly accessible. Um, but, you know, it's pretty amazing what we've been doing in the last two years. So Tom, it is it's truly amazing. And I actually do have a question relative to that. So you guys have had years of experience and, um, and really know what you're doing. But for those of us who might be just starting out and trying to document things, um, just going a little bit beyond a regular compass, what would you say would be the first thing for someone to do? Um, I think that um, that what I would suggest is finding your most technically interested and um, able person and getting a subscription to ArcGIS and just starting to learn the capabilities from that level so that you can take points um, and get them onto a map and start working on your database. Um, and you can even, even with, even if you just had, um, ArcGIS and a camera, you could get points and pictures into ArcGIS. Um, that would be, there, there are other ways to go. I mean, there are, you can get, you can get photographs into Google Earth without, without the expense of ArcGIS. Um, so there are those options as well, but I think what ArcGIS has to offer um, is the database aspect. Um, I've seen a lot of people who take photographs and points on, um, on a GPS, and then they have to transcribe those, um, and it's a lot of work. Um, whereas with GIS, you can just bring in all of those points into the database. Um, that maybe is not as a baby step as you were hoping for, but. No, I think that's, that's actually perfect. Um, we have one person who's written in not exactly a question, but this comes from Jim Rock. And he said three things, do no harm, reverse the harm done, and indigenous relationships with the land come first. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Good points, Jim. Okay. He also says, until more relationships with Indigenous folks are live and on site, I don't think everyone should be out in the field measuring. Another good, another good point. Thank you, Jim. 
I think that I, I agreed with Jim on that. Um, part of the work that we have, part of the ceremonial landscapes research has been to work in conjunction with tribes. What we have done over the years is go out and be the mapping unit for, for tribes. And that's a way to help preserve things as well as to document them for the future. And for people who don't know, um, Tom and Eva, and particularly Eva over the years, have worked very closely with the tribes, particularly with um, Doug Harris from the Narragansett. I think we're just about out of time. Um, and so I want to thank Tom and Eva again. Also thank the Acton Memorial Library and Freedom's Way National Heritage Area and, and the Free... Uh, Friends of Pine Oak for making these programs um, possible. We have two interesting ones coming up. Next Monday, Robert Goodby, a uh, New Hampshire archeologist, will talk about a 13,000 year old site. And then on November 3rd, a very well-known um, person who's documented native sites for a long time, or to, uh, presumed to be native sites, um, Peter Waxman will be here to talk about his experience over that time. In the meantime, thank you very much. We hope to see you soon in the future. And uh, thank you to everybody. Good night.